speaker is Kansis Matu. So Kansis holds an, an MSc in Applied Meteorology from the University of Reading. And she, most recently, she worked for the National Center for Atmospheric Science here in the UK as a research assistant. Her research has focused on energy meteorology and particularly in tropical cyclone impacts in Mexico, which is the topic of, of, uh, of her talk. She is currently working as a submission specialist at Frontiers, but she, she hopes to continue her research in the future. So yeah, I, I, I would support that. Um, okay, so without anything else, so please, Kansis, the floor is yours. Can you uh, share your screen? Yes, let me just get that sorted. There it is. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kansas, and today I'm going to present the research I carried out as part of my Applied Meteorology Masters, which I then continued after graduation, as Oscar said. So, the research paper is titled The Impact of Tropical Cyclones on Potential Offshore Wind Farms in Mexico. So to give a quick overview of my presentation today, I'll briefly explain the motivations behind this research, followed by a summary of, summary of the data and methods used before diving into the results produced and finally the conclusions. So it's 2021 and we are amid a climate crisis. Burning fossil fuels to produce energy has led to irreversible environmental damage. Therefore, now more than ever, it is crucial to implement clean energy practices, such as harnessing the wind's kinetic energy to, uh, to produce electricity. Specific areas are more preferable for harnessing this wind energy and one country which shows excellent wind energy potential is Mexico, as we've just heard all about. So Mexico is located in Central America and its unique geography between the Atlantic and Pacific Basin in the region of the trade winds gives rise to favourable near surface wind speeds throughout the year for wind energy production. However, because of Mexico's location, it makes it vulnerable to potentially damaging tropical cyclones. So also known as hurricanes, tropical cyclones are rotating low pressure systems made up of organized convection, which presents as thunderstorms. The extensive damage to both property and human life results in tropical cyclones receiving heavy media coverage. In the United States, for example, Tropical cyclones rank as the costliest natural disaster as a single storm can cost billions um, of dollars worth of damage. So previous studies have shown that wind power potential in Mexico is predominantly located in offshore coastal regions, again, as we've just heard about. And in order to successfully progress the use of wind energy in Mexico, we have to consider and understand the impacts that tropical cyclones might have on offshore wind farms by performing a risk assessment. So therefore, in this research, we asked whether um, there were any regions in Mexico which combine a high generating potential and a low risk from tropical cyclones. This is completed through quantifying the risk posed by the wind associated with major hurricanes affecting those regions in Mexico which are favourable for offshore wind energy production. We, execute, we executed this through identifying regions of Mexico which present a viable capacity factor and then we did a case study analysis of major hurricanes, uh, which affected the selected sites. And then finally, we looked at the return period analysis of historical tropical cyclones in Mexico. But moving on, I'll briefly touch on the data and methods used to complete this research. So two data sets were used, the first of which is IB Tracks, or the International Best Track Archive for Climate Stewardship. And this was used to compute the tropical cyclone return periods and to perform bias correction on ERA-5 derived uh, wind speeds. So IB tracks is a standardized set of observations from several international meteorological agencies, which contain several parameters such as tropical cyclone center location and the maximum sustained wind speed. And the second, the second data set we used was the ERA-5 reanalysis which is produced by the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast. Uh, medium range weather forecast. So this data set was used to provide an estimation of the, min, uh, the mean wind resource during hurricane season, which is uh, June to November, and to analyse the statistics of near surface wind speeds in the vicinity of a tropical cyclone. So the year five 100 metre 
hourly horizontal wind components were used to compute 100 meter horizontal wind speeds as an estimate of wind speed at hub height, um, and that's hub height of a wind turbine, which typically ranges from 70 to 120 meters tall. And to provide an estimation of the mean resource during hurricane season, the hourly era five drive 100 meter wind speed was then turned into a capacity factor using the power curve of a class one Enercon E70 2.3 megawatt wind turbine. So then our cyclone tracking was completed using a method uh, developed by Hodges et al. And this employs an objective feature tracking algorithm, which is used to identify tropical cyclones within the era five data, and then tracks the path of the cyclone centers Tropical cyclone associated wind speeds were investigated using a modified version uh, devised by Roberts et al. because they investigated European wind storms and here we're looking at tropical cyclones. So the wind speed footprint is given by the maximum hourly 100 meter wind speed at each grid point within a 7.5 geodesic degree radius around the center of a tropical uh, cyclone for the duration of its life cycle. And then finally, Tropical cyclone return periods have been estimated as the inverse of the probability of the next occurrence of a given event. So we have considered two types of events, the first being tropical cyclones making landfall in Mexico, and the second being tropical cyclones with a 10 meter wind speed maxima above a given threshold occurring in the vicinity of a potential offshore wind farm site. And this was completed using a poison distribution, which depends on a single parameter. And here that parameter is the occurrence rate. And this can be described as the number of tracks which pass through a two geodesic degree spherical cap centered at the location of interest. Uh, this might not make sense now, but as we go forward with the results, this will all come into play. So my first result section is our potential offshore wind farm site. So here we have a map of Mexico and You'll see the four sites here, and I'll go into a bit more detail. So this study focuses on four offshore wind sites in Mexico, which have been identified as having a high wind resource potential. The sites are the Yucatan Peninsula, Tamaulipas, Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and the Baja California Peninsula. So the first two sites in the Gulf of Mexico were identified by Canel Reyes, which we heard about, uh, we just heard about, um, and in addition to wind energy production potential, included uh, factors such as distance to the coast, seafloor depth, and biodiversity protection to, given, uh, to determine the feasibility of a given site. And so then the other two sites, the uh, Isthmus of Tehuantepec and the Baja California Peninsula, have been chosen based off of previous wind resource assessment work. So this figure on the left shows the mean capacity factor for a class one wind turbine during hurricane season, uh, which is from June 1st to November 30th. So the capacity factor has been derived from the era five 100 meter wind speeds for the period of 1980 to 2017. So the black circles here represent a 3.8 geodesic spherical cap centered around the hypothetical location of the wind farms that you can see here. On the color bar, we have the capacity factor um, and the darker color indicates a higher capacity factor going up to 60% there. So from this figure, we can see that each of the selected sites has a capacity factor of above 20%. As you can see, it's darker within all of the caps and then in the central region of Mexico, it's much lower towards zero. So the estimate of Tehuantepec has the highest uh, mean capacity factor during hurricane season at over 40%. And this region is considered one of the best regions globally to exploit wind energy due to the strong and persistent Tufanos wind channeling through the gap in the mountains. And then we have Baja California and Tamaulipas have around uh, 25 to 30% capacity factor and the Northwest of the Yucatan Peninsula has around 20 to 25%. So the figure on the right has been produced to understand the capacity factor evolution throughout the year at each site, displaying the minimum, median, and maximum values of the monthly mean capacity factor. So this shows that there is a strong seasonal climatology um, with a maximum in the winter and a minimum in the summer. 
So previous studies have only assessed the mean annual wind speeds giving rise to viable wind speeds throughout the year. However, our analysis has shown that this isn't necessarily the case. So the capacity factor must be greater than 19% throughout the year to be worthwhile financially and to consistently produce energy. So the seasonal cycle is most prominent in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, uh, which is this dark blue color here. And you can see that it is the most prominent. And this is due to a funneling effect of, cold, uh, of air from cold surges moving south from the continental US during the winter and being accelerated through the gap in the topography that is between the Sierra Madre de Oaxaca to the west and the Sierra Madre de Chiapas to the east. And from the data presented, uh, Tamaulipas um, has the most viable capacity factor throughout the year. So Tamaulipas is the red line. So the minimum, median and maximum values for this site all follow a similar evolution um, with a maximum in April and a minimum in September. Uh, and the minimum, the monthly mean minimum falls to 10% in September. And although the Isthmus of Tehuantepec presents the highest capacity factor here, um, it's highly variable throughout the year and therefore it's not as desirable when considering stable energy production. So during the months of the hurricane season, um, the capacity factors are generally low. So that's looking from June until November is generally lower than in the winter time. And so this could be due to high wind speed cutout associated with passing tropical cyclones or due to the generally low wind conditions at times when uh, tropical cyclones are not present. So I'll now move on to the second section of results, which is the case study analysis of major hurricanes affecting the selected sites. Okay. So tropical cyclones are generally categorized by their maximum one minute sustained wind speed at a height of 10 meters. When the sustained wind speed exceeds 33 meters per second, um, a tropical cyclone is known as a hurricane in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific basins. So tropical cyclones which surpass a category two hurricane on the severe Simpson scale um, exceed the design limit of a turbine as outlined by the Electrotechnical Commission. So this is because electricity can only be produced within certain wind thresholds and the wind turbines are not designed to exceed the load much higher than the cutout speed. So the power curve here shows the relationship between the power output and the wind velocity. So when considering the impacts of a tropical cyclone, we are most interested in the cutout speed being 25 meters per second, as um, tropical cyclones fundamentally surpass this threshold. So wind turbines are not designed to withstand this high speed. And, uh, offshore wind turbine would be likely to collapse if it was exposed to a Category 5 hurricane. If I go back here, you can see a Category 5 hurricane has wind speeds in excess of 70 metres per second. So to look at this further, a case study analysis of four major hurricanes, two in the Atlantic and two in the Pacific, was completed to investigate the impact of selected extreme tropical cyclones on potential offshore wind farm locations. Hurricanes were chosen based on the premise that each would have impacted at least one of one of the proposed offshore wind farm sites. So using uh, these conditions, the following hurricanes were chosen for analysis. We have Hurricane Gilbert of 1988, Hurricane Wilma of 2005, Hurricane Odile of 2014, and Hurricane Patricia of 2015. The hurricane tracks the associated 100 meter wind speed footprint and areas in which cutout would have been experienced are shown on this diagram, but I'm going to go into a bit more detail on each of them. So to begin, we've got Hurricane Patricia, but I'll show you what this figure is actually showing. So you can see here that we have the colour bar and this is a 100 meter wind speed. And this um, region is 7.5 geodesic degree radius from the track. So this black line is the tropical cyclone track and each of the dots are the vorticity at six hour time steps. So the bigger the dot, the larger the vorticity, which means it's um, stronger. 
So we can see here in this beige region, that's between zero and 25 meters per second. So additionally on here, we have a set of contours. So this brown contour is um, hours above 25 meters per second. So the brown contour is one hour above 25 meters per second. The white contour is 24 hours and the purple is 48 hours. So this is Hurricane Patricia, which was a category five hurricane that occurred in October 2015 in the Pacific Basin. Now Patricia broke records in the Western Hemisphere for the minimum central pressure and maximum sustained surface wind speeds of 95 meters per second. So the figure shows that there was the potential for high wind speeds in the Genesis region of Patricia at the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is just here. And we can see that in this um, white contour, there would have been up to 24 hours of cutout would have been experienced. However, these high wind speeds did not exceed the threshold for potential structural damage, which would be above uh, 50 meters per second. So, Hurricane Patricia moves northwest and then veers northeast towards the Tamale Pass site. So it dissipates by the time it gets here and it not much cut out would have actually been experienced by the time it got there. So IB track data shows that this hurricane had the highest 10 meter wind speeds out of all our chosen case studies, which I've highlighted here. So this shows our IB tracks. Uh, wind speed and it shows that Patricia was actually 95 meters per second was the highest sustained wind speed. However, the bias correction um, only translates the ERA 5 36 meters per second into 63 meters per second. So this suggests that even after our bias correction that 100 meter wind speeds associated with Hurricane Patricia have been poorly captured by ERA 5. And this underrepresentation of extreme near surface winds has been previously documented by Hodges et al. So moving forward, the results from these case studies should be thought of as a lower bound for the potential risk that a hurricane such as Patricia could cause to the sites of Isthmus of Tehuantepec and um, Tamaulipas. Secondly, we have Hurricane Odile, which is our next Pacific born hurricane, which was a category four and occurred in September 2014. This is the first major hurricane to make landfall in the Baja California area in 25 years. And it's tied as the strongest landfalling hurricane to ever affect this region. So a deal made landfall in Baja California on the 15th of September as a category C hurricane. And it would have affected the potential um, offshore wind farm site, which is located in this area here. So the maximum wind speeds from 25 to 50 meters per second are experienced at the site. Um, so that is the dark orange colour, and we can see that that would be experienced here. And it's also within the contour for at least one hour of cutout. But apart from that, Odile wouldn't have caused too much damage as the more damaging winds are to the right of where the site would be. Next, we have our first Atlantic hurricane, which is Hurricane Wilma. And this is a record-breaking hurricane, which occurred in October 2005, and it passed through the Yucatan region here. So Wilma um, had a record-breaking minimum central pressure of 882 hectopascals, and this is one of the lowest ever recorded. So it started in an area of low pressure in the south of Jamaica, and it quickly developed into a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, the quick progression of tropical cyclones to hurricanes is um, one of the reasons that we've also used hourly um, measurements of wind speed because they, they do um, develop so quickly. So from this figure, we can see that the 24 to 48 hours of potential cutout would have been experienced at the Yucatan site. As you can see, the Yucatan site would be here. It falls within this brown, brown contour, the white contour, and depending whereabouts it would be, it could fall within this purple contour as well. So that would be up to 48 hours of cutout of energy. But the wind speed did not exceed 50 meters per second. So it is unlikely that there would be any structural damage. And it is very narrowly missing the 50 meters per second as it's, uh, that is represented by this yellow region here and the site would be here. So as it can show you that if it had been slightly more to the west, it may have incurred structural damage. 
Um, after hitting the Yucatan Peninsula, it then veers northeast towards Florida. It regains intensity, and you can see that when it makes landform, landfall in Florida, it is um, in excess of 90 metres per second wind, so there would definitely be structural damage there. Finally, um, of our case studies, we have Hurricane Gilbert, which was the strongest recorded tropical cyclone to make landfall in Mexico, and it again broke a number of meteorological records. Um, on September 13th, Gilbert classified as a Category 5 hurricane, and the following day it made landfall in the Yucatan Peninsula, whilst remaining a Category 5 hurricane. So you can see here that Gilbert comes straight across the Yucatan Peninsula, and it would have went right through where the proposed wind farm site is here. It would have experienced um, winds in excess of 70 metres per second. And there would have been 24 to 48 hours of cut out again. So um, if wind farms had been present, they, they would have been damaged badly. The interesting thing is that it, as it travels across the Gulf of Mexico, it weakens to a category three, and it actually then hits the Tamaulipas site as well. So um, it would have caused an additional 24 to 48 hours of cut out at this site. So but um, it wouldn't have caused any structural damages by the time it actually gets there, it has weakened enough. But this is a prime example of how one major hurricane could potentially hinder production at two offshore wind farms just within a matter of days of each other because it hit the Yucatan Peninsula one day and then the following it was at Ta uh, Tamaulipas. So these four case studies have shown that Category 4 and 5 hurricanes do have the potential to cause periods of low generation due to wind speed cut out at the proposed offshore wind farm sites. The possibility of structural damage to wind farms is also possible, particularly for the sites um, in the Gulf of Mexico. As for these case studies, the Atlantic Basin hurricanes have been of stronger intensity. But all hurricanes would, of course, a minimum one hour cut out at the respective sites. Both Atlantic hurricanes, Gilbert and Wilma, and both Pacific hurricanes, Odile and Patricia, display a similar evolution as shown in this uh, prob probability density function. So we can see that in cyan and red, we have Gilbert and um, Wilma, and then in blue and pink, we have Patricia and Odile. And the results are shown in this table here. For Odile and Patricia, 95% of the 100 metre wind speeds are below the 25 metres per second cut out, and more than 99% of the wind speeds are below the 50 metre um, per second threshold for potential structural damage. These two case studies suggest that it is unlikely for a Pacific born hurricane to result in structural damage to a wind form at these proposed sites. In contrast, during Gilbert and Wilma, only 80% of um, winds were below the cutout speed with an additional two to three percent chance of potential structural damage with winds above 50 meters per second. So for these cases, there is a 15% increase chance that cutout will occur from the passage of an atlantic born hurricane um, compared to those in the Pacific. And on a more positive note, large areas of wind speeds wind speeds viable for energy production are also associated with these hurricanes. So this would be wind speeds up to 25 metres per second um, so you can actually get energy production. As you can see from our wind speed footprint, there are regions that fall within the 0 to 25 um, metres per second for all of them. Um, so you could get viable wind energy, wind energy production there. So this is one of the positive impacts of the passage of a tropical cyclone. So I'm going to move on to my final section of results now, which is the long-term risk assessment. So despite the level of detail that can be learned from the case studies presented, they are only representative examples and a full risk assessment is required to confirm which sites um, are at greatest long-term risk of passing tropical cyclones. And this is what we look at in our next section. So we first assess the long-term risk of tropical cyclones on offshore wind farms by considering the variability in annual frequency of tropical cyclones exceeding thresholds of 25 metres per second. 
um, which I've mentioned is the typical cutout speed for a wind turbine, and then 50 meters per second as the maximum extreme as the maximum extreme um, wind speed of a class one turbine. So this figure I'll explain here. So we have section A, which is the annual frequency of all tropical cyclones. So there is a no threshold applied to this. This is all tropical cyclones that have passed through one of the four sites um, represented by each color. Um, and figure B, we have the wind speeds exceeding 25 meters per second. And then in C, it is um, tropical cyclones with wind speeds exceeding 50 meters per second. So this figure gives an overview of the tropical cyclone climatology at each of the sites. And from the first figure here, you can see that the Isthmus of Tehuantepec reports the highest number of tropical cyclones, but that's because at that specific location, um, it gives rise to desirable conditions for tropical cyclone genesis. Um, before they um, propagate away from the area, so they don't actually um, pick up much wind speed there. So it should be noted that um, the majority of tropical cyclones which actually follow this path, they stay to the west of the region and away from the shallower ocean, so they wouldn't actually be of much risk from impacting energy generation, as we've heard that um, wind farms have to be within 44 kilometres of the coast. So Baja California reports the lowest number of tropical cyclones, which can be attributed to the influence of the North Pacific High, as this presence increases wind shear and uh, in turn destroys the vertical structure of tropical cyclones before they are able to reach Baja California. So looking at figure B, we can see that there are several years where only one site experiences cut out ex um, due to a tropical cyclone. So for example, we can see it in 1979 and 85, and then more recently in 2018. So additionally, there was no cutout experience at any of the sites in 1981, 82, 86, and 91. But on the other hand, 2003 is the only year where all four sites experienced a uh, cutout due to a tropical cyclone, which would be here. But out of the nearly 40 years of data we have, this is only a current one. So it would be quite a rare occurrence that all would experience cut out in the same year. Figure C highlights that both the Gulf of Mexico sites, the Yucatan Peninsula and Tamaulipas, um, shown in red and in cyan here have experienced the highest number of tropical cyclones exceeding 50 meters per second. As you can see, they make up the majority of this and then the estimates of Tehuantepec and Baja California are on here only once. So there has been coinciding cases in 1980, 1988 and 2005. And as previously mentioned, Hurricane Gilbert of 1988 actually caused cut out, would have caused cut out at both the Yucatan Peninsula and the Tamalisa sites. Therefore, this one bar is um, represented just by that one hurricane alone. And then from figure eight, we can see that historically, several tropical cyclones occur each year at every site. But then when we look at figure C, we can see that um, there are several years and periods of time where no tropical cyclones exceeding 50 meters per second occurred at any of the sites. So this emphasizes the effect of interannual variability and the need for multiple years of data to be used moving forward for wind farm risk assessment in order to capture the full range of potential tropical cyclone related damage. So now we've looked at tropical cyclone frequency at the selected sites, we can explore this further by analyzing the wind speed distribution of the tropical cyclones. So the figure here shows the probability density function of tropical cyclones, with a maximum 10 meter wind speeds, which occurred within the neighborhood of each site. So no minimum threshold has been applied to this. So it includes all tropical cyclones. And then the results from this are displayed in the table here. So the Gulf of Mexico sites 
Yucatan Peninsula and Tamaulipas, exhibit the highest probability of experiencing cutout during passage of the TC at 33.6% and 27.9%. And furthermore, there's about a 5% chance that wind speeds will exceed 50 metres per second. The Pacific sites, on the other hand, um, have a notably lower probabilities at um, 17 and 18%. And the low probability of having tropical cyclone related wind speeds exceeding 50 meters per second can again be related to um, Baja California and Isthmus of Tehuantepec being um, genesis and decay regions for uh, tropical cyclones. So tropical cyclones are less likely to sustain extreme wind speeds during the beginning, the very beginning and the very end of their life cycle, which is um, where Baja California and the essence of Tehuantepec are. So when looking at the results here, it should be noted that we have used the 10 meter wind speed rather, um, this is the 10 meter wind speed recorded by IB tracks rather than the 100 meter wind speed. So this again implies that these results should be um, they give a lower bound for the probabilities. So we would expect that at 100 metres, um, all of these probabilities would be higher. So I'm now going to move on to our final section of the tropical cyclone impact assessment, which combines the findings from the very first section and the second section. Okay, so this is our tropical cyclone impact map. So this figure has been created as a risk assessment map which identifies regions of viable wind energy production. So the colour bar down here represents the return period in years of tropical cyclones making landfall in Mexico. And the orange contours here represent um, a capacity factor of 20% during hurricane season, which is June to November. And then the black crosses represent all of the proposed sites. So looking at this initially, we are interested in sites which have a high return period. So we're looking for the lighter colours. And um, we also want it to fall within these contours. So it's got a viable capacity factor. So as expected, when considering risk, regions which are near the coast have a higher risk of being affected by a hurricane um, due to the fundamental reason that hurricanes are an oceanic phenomena. So you can see that many of the coastal regions have a quite a low return period of zero to two years on the, the west coast here and then in, in the Gulf of Mexico. So regions, um, so this is, um, as I said, due to the fact that hurricanes come off of the water. Um, so to modulate this risk a bit further, we we then we then began to look at the wind speed thresholds again, which I've mentioned, which are 25 meters per second and 50 meters per second. So again, there's no threshold on this map at all, and this is um, including all um, tropical cyclones and as and. As Mexico is a, a tropical, subtropical region, you would expect there to be um, this many um, tropical cyclones affecting it. But as I said, there's no threshold, so these could just be category one hurricanes. Okay, so this figure gives a further insight um, of the risk posed by tropical cyclones when considering wind speed thresholds. So the three thresholds, again, are We've got all tropical cyclones, so that's a threshold of zero meters per second, and then 25 meters per second, and 50 meters per second. So the color bar here is the same as the previous slide, except you'll notice that it goes up to 256 years this time. And uh, the return periods here have been derived from the tropical cyclone tracks crossing the neighborhoods of the four selected sites. And the neighborhoods are shown by the black circles, which are centered over each of the crosses. So this row is Baja California, this is Isthmus of Tehuantepec, this is Tamaulipas, and this is the Yucatan Peninsula. So when we look at the first column, which includes all of the tropical cyclones which have passed through the neighborhood of the site, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, 
families have and the Yucatan Peninsula exhibit similar risk with return series ranging from two to four years, which is in these darker colours here. And you can actually see that the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is the darkest colour and that has got a return period of only one year. However, again, this can just be accounted for by the fact that this is a Genesis region. Um, and then in contrast, when we look at Baja California, uh, this is already exhibiting um, higher return periods. So within this neighbourhood, they range from two to 16 years. The differences between the sites become more prominent as the wind speed threshold increases. So moving to the middle column here, which is um, a wind speed threshold of greater than 25 metres per second, the sites can be ordered according to their longest return period, starting with Baja California, which exhibits the longest return periods between four and 64 years. Here, as we start to get into the, the green colour, which is um, here, four to 64 years. And finishing with the Yucatan Peninsula, which has still got a, a shorter return period of between two and eight years. So at this wind speed threshold, there's still no clear difference between sites on the, the Pacific and the, the Gulf Coast, because as you can and see here, it's all still relatively the same colour. However, when we begin to look at the threshold of over 50 metres per second, I think we can start to see a real difference between the Pacific sites and the Atlantic sites. So when considering wind speeds exceeding 50 metres per second, the Pacific sites exhibit very long return periods beyond 128 and 64 years for the cases of Baja California and the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, respectively. Whereas in contrast, the sites on the Gulf of Mexico are um, exhibiting much shorter return periods between 8 and 64 years um, in, in both cases for these. Thus, the conclusions drawn from the neighbourhood analysis, they're consistent with what we saw um, by, the, by looking at the landfall and tropical cyclones in the previous slide, in which the differences seen at high wind speed thresholds between Pacific and Gulf of Mexico sites are due to their location with respect to the typical uh, tropical cyclone tracks that visit each neighbourhood. So as a consequence, the tropical cyclones passing through the neighbourhoods of Isthmus of Tehuantepec and Baja California are at the start and end of the cyclone tracks, respectively. Um, therefore, they are less likely to give rise to such high winds, because as I've, I've said, um, they're at the, the Genesis and the Cay region, so the, the strongest winds aren't experienced at that point during the tropical cyclone life cycle. And on the other hand, tropical cyclones crossing through uh, Tamaulipas and Yucatan Peninsula are more likely to be in their maximum intensity phase, and therefore they are more likely to reach damaging wind speeds. So, to conclude, um, in this research, we've investigated the risk of tropical cyclones on potential offshore wind farm sites in Mexico. The risk assessment of four potential offshore wind farm sites performed through a case study analysis and a return period analysis of historical tropical cyclones. The four selected regions in Baja California, Yucatan Peninsula, Isthmus of Tehuantepec and Tamaulipas um, were all found to show suitable wind energy um, throughout the year with a capacity factor of greater than 20%. There Analysis of the four major hurricanes has shown differences between Pacific and Atlantic cyclones at high wind speeds in particular, because it's really when they get into looking at over 50 metres per second, we see the real differences. Thus, while the four hurricanes would have led to periods of low generation and cutout, the Atlantic cyclones were more likely to have actually caused damage to um, an offshore wind farm. So the sites in the Gulf of Mexico will be more frequently impacted and potentially damaged by um, hurricanes rather than the sites on the Pacific coast. Um, so the findings of this research are relevant for wind farm planning in the future as um, extreme weather has to be considered. So I'd just like to give some acknowledgements to my dissertation supervisors who then became my co-authors. So thank you very much to Hannah, Simon, Oscar and Osvaldo for all of your help with this research. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kansis. Uh, 
please let's let's thank Kansis with your with a virtual applause. Um, and if you have any questions, raise your hand or put it in the chat. So I can see that there are already three questions in the chat. So the first one is from from Marco Antonio. It says footprints by wind speed is somehow well documented on the damage of touristic infrastructure. Such historic uh, is such historic record being considered on selection site in this case. So we looked at the case studies after we had selected the sites. So um, yeah, we we selected the sites. So um, the the footprint didn't have any impact on how we chose the sites because they were chosen just based off of the the wind speed. Uh, and I mean the wind energy potential of those regions rather than how they were already impacted by uh, tropical cyclones. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diego asks uh, whether you can you can explain a little bit more about the bias correction that you used in the results. <laughs> yes, um, so we use um, quantile quantile um, bias correction, if I believe correctly um but it was mostly oscar that did a lot of the bias correction and i just applied it and um it was because in era five the the wind speeds are just so poorly captured so by using the IB tracks observational data i just brought them up to something that was a little bit more realistic but for the the technical side of that i can't really give any more information unfortunately yeah well yeah i, I can i can i can say it, it is actually quantile mapping and it's uh, we only bias corrected the um, uh, winds near the near hurricanes it, it, it was it was sort of valid only for 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 the during the presence of a hurricane not in general so bias correction is is always a bit of, a, of an open question so okay the, the third question is by Carla, and she says she asks, uh, by what percentage does the damage to wind turbines reduce their their years of life in each area? Oh, so that, that's a brilliant question, and that's actually not something that we looked into in this study. Um, it's definitely something that we would need to be um, further researched and um, moving forward, but this is more just an, uh, an initial impact assessment to see um, what the, the da damage that could occur just from the, the climatology of tropical cyclones. But I think that's something that's really important. And that's why we, we kind of looked at the return periods because I know that a wind farm has usually got a lifespan of about 30 years. So you kind of want a return period that's going to be higher than 30 years. So you're not going to have a lot of structural damage within that period. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? Your last chance. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any anything else. Thank you very much, Kansis.